one of the things I love about Christmas, now that I have kids, I didn't get a single thing for this Christmas. I, I, I'd kind of buy what I, <laughs> what I want throughout the year. Ashley said she got me something. It hasn't come in the mail yet, she said, which is fine. But I, she was, oh, I feel so bad it hasn't come yet. And I said, babe, my enjoyment is watching you and the kids open your gifts. And, but, but think of that in, 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 in the worldly context. It's more blessed to give than receive. Well, well, even that's somewhat selfish and has somewhat of a hook because what's blessed about it? I enjoy, I get, I enjoy watching them. There's still a selfish, somewhat of a selfish reason in, in, in that. Yeah, I love to give my kids, it's more blessed to give my kids gifts than receive them myself, but in even that, I'm, I'm, I'm garnering some real satisfaction from watching them open their gifts. But tonight I want to look at something more than just giving. I want to look at giving, but the title of this sermon is The Broken Giving Life. In John 17, in the preceding verses, where this is the Last Supper, and Jesus makes clear in His prayer here in John 17 that His prayer was the clear result and His life was the clear result of the Father's giving nature. How many of you know Jesus only did what He saw the, fa- the will of His Father? I have not come to do anything except the will of the Father. And we're going to read John chapter 17. It's somewhat wordy, but I want to pick something out specifically from this chapter. It says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Before I go any further, how many of you remember the last sermon, I think it was, we, we had here? What was different when, when we, we talked about how the Greeks came and they said sir, to Philip, and they said, Sir, we would see Jesus. And all of the times leading up to that moment, Jesus said, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. And the main thing that we looked at that was different about that situation was what? The Gentiles were finally starting to seek him. And that's when he said, my hour has come. And I want you to keep that in mind. That that, that's kind of an off, off, uh, uh, offshoot and a little bit of a rabbit trail of what we're looking at tonight. But think of this, this attitude of giving and that whole concept of he had came for the Gentiles, to to reach even the Gentiles. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you. I'm going to emphasize a certain word I want you to take notice of in the next few verses. As you have given Him authority over all flesh, that He should give eternal life to as many as you have given Him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given to me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in this world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those who you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but for those who will believe in me. Who is that? Who's he speaking of there? Us. Us. All the following believers. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. 
And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they ha- may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Did you notice a recurring theme in that section of Scripture? 17 times Jesus uses a form of the word gave 17 different times. Gave, given. 17 different times. And if you realize, if you notice in that context, what is he saying most often? Father, you have given. Father, you have gave. Right? What is the nature of the Father? To give. To give. You know, so often in Christianity, we get so fixated on on Jesus, which is, don't get me wrong, that's an excellent thing. I'm not in any way saying that's not a good thing. But sometimes I think we, and I, I noticed in the last year in my own life, it was like I never even mentioned the word Father in my prayers. But Jesus actually said I, to, that we are to pray to the Father, our Father who art in heaven. And now I, I, when I pray, I, I certainly I still pray to Jesus Christ, but I, I come to, before the Father. I say, I say, Father, in the name of your Son, I come before you over this need or over that thing. But it is in the Father's nature to give. Jesus only did that. When we see all these mighty miracles and all the wonderful things Jesus did for people, it was as a result of him seeing the will of the Father to do those things. That is the Father's nature to give. It's amazing because, like I've said in times past, the last words of someone are usually what we really cling to as important. Well, one of the Jesus' last things before the cross was what? This prayer and bringing out that, that concept of how giving the Father is. A few of the things that he gave Jesus. Jesus says in John 17 that the Father gave him authority over all flesh. He gave him a work to do. He even gave him his glory. Psalms verse 2, in a prophecy concerning the coming Messiah, he said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and surely I will give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. Jesus has the same nature of his father. His prayer brings out various things he had given, and not only to Jesus, but the things the Father wanted to give to the disciples. And not only his disciples, but future followers. He wanted the Father to give them his word. He wanted the Father to give us his truth, and even the glory of the Father and the Son. Think of that for a moment. He says, Father, I want you you to give them glory, our glory, your glory. The glory of the Father and the Son and the awesome thing when he starts out that prayer is eternal life. Eternal life. This prayer is an excellent example of the giving nature of God's heart. This is one of my high-end verses, verses one of the verses I really love, high on my list. Matthew 7, verses 8 through 11. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Are you catching the drift here? The Father loves to give. I, I, I've preached in times past about the, the, the story of the prodigal son and, and we brought, I brought out the thought of how it was more of the prodigal father, how he just lavishes. He, the, the son comes home and it's like he doesn't even, basically you would think there'd be this big, big long dialogue between the two of them and he runs out, throws his arms around him, kisses his neck and says, kill the fatted calf, bring out the best robe and places a ring on his finger. That's the heart of the father towards his children. The Last Supper from John chapter 13 to 17, we see Jesus' last will and testament, if you will. And a recurring theme in this whole thing, in that whole section of Scripture, is His giving nature. But not just that only. His call to the disciples 
to do the same. What does he do? He washes the feet of the, of the, of the disciples, right? And we could spend a, a whole weeks and months studying just that. But what does he say when he's all done? If I, the master, have done this, I want you to do so for each other, right? I, I am, the Father is a giving person, a giving deity. I am, a, I am just like him because I only do his will. That's my nature to give. But I expect you guys to do the same thing. What does he do in that Last Supper? He breaks the bread, his body, and he gives it. This is my body which I give for you. He pours out the wine which is a symbol of his blood, and he gives it. His very own body, flesh and blood. That is what a poured out life looks like. That is someone that is giving much more than they're receiving. And his calling to us is the same, to give. Giving a giving nature is what it looks like to be a son or daughter of God. Well, how, do, how, how can you tell Christians apart? You know, the world, unfortunately, there's a real problem in, in the body of Christ. A lot of unsaved people can't tell the difference between, oh, what's so good about that guy? He's no different than me. That's because we've lost the concept that giving is what the nature is of a son and daughter of, and child of the King. If we are His children, if we have been born again, we have been adopted into a giving lifestyle. Think about that for a moment. What is the nature of the Father? To give. What is the nature of the Son? To give. We have now been adopted into that family, so it is only a logical conclusion that our nature should be to give. That is the real purpose-driven life. Best-selling Christian books seem to be mainly centered on the getting side of life these days. It doesn't, it doesn't take a whole lot of discernment to go in any Christian bookstore and you will find tons and tons, if not most, I, would, I, I hesitate to put a percentage number on it, but I can guarantee you it's well over 50, of books, all real popular, about how we can be blessed, how we can receive. The whole time we walk around saying, well, it's more blessed to give than receive, yet every book on the shelf is about getting, not giving. We need to have the concept of a giving lifestyle, not the getting lifestyle. These books are all about God just wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. Just, just name an area of life, your finances, how He wants to bless your finances. He wants to bless your health. He wants to bless your wealth. He wants to bless your marriages. He wants to bless everything about you. I'm sure you've all heard of the prosperity teaching. There's a reason why that is so popular. Anytime you turn on a Christian television show, channel, what do you hear? God just wants to bless you. And it's amazing. I, 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 it's, no doubt, it's, no, it's no wonder why the ungodly shakes, mocks us and shakes their head, us, head at us because you turn on the Christian television you have some TV evangelist up there saying how God wants to bless you as he's in his, his $1,000 Armani three-piece suit and he's saying to you, to the people, give us your money, give us a seed of, of blessing and God will bless you even more in return. And they, they take the scripture and they twist it and they bend it and they, they will see, you know, if you, if you give, it'll be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken over, more than your cup can hold. But what is that all about? It's all me-centered. It's all self-centered. And it doesn't take a whole lot of, again, it doesn't take a whole lot of discernment to look at the lives of these people that are preaching that and realize there's a problem. But again, if, if, if we weren't prone to that as humans, that doctrine would have not lasted as long as it had. It would have failed long ago. But unfortunately, it is not only a part of the body of Christ in the modern day America, it's the majority. It's a very popular movement, so much so, like I said, it, it, it almost never fails that when I click on the TV channel in a hotel, because I don't have cable, and I turn on a Christian television show, that's what's being promoted. Now certainly, I want to make this clear. God does, as I've already said, God has a very giving nature. He does want to bless us. Just as I read in Matthew, the good gifts. If you being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more so your Father? We've looked in the past at the verse where he says he has lavished on us. That's a really nice adjective. But he desires us to be the same as he is. How many of you know the difference between a swamp and a fresh body of water? Anybody know? A swamp has an inlet, but no outlet. That's a lot of Christians. 
That's all of our propensity to be a swamp. We like to receive. We like to have inlets of God's blessing. The problem is it begins to stagnate. And then Christians scratch their head and wonder why they're not getting victory and why they're not growing in maturity. It's because they don't have an outlet. I've given you the example of the cup in times past. How when the, the, the Holy Spirit comes and He pours His, His blessing, we need our cups should be overflowing and we should be, be taking our cups and pouring it to other people and then we'll get more and then we pour it out and we get more and then we pour it out and we get more. I would even dare say we need to take pencils and stab our cup full of holes so, so that blessing is always leaking out. However, the example is you want to you wanna look at it, the, the, this cup is not meant to, to, to just hold a little bit of water. It's, it's, in, in our lives, it's meant to constantly be overflowing with blessing. And you know, the amazing thing about that is, one of the byproducts of all that is, you are getting blessed. That's, the, that's, that's kind of the neat part about it. It isn't that you get blessed and, and you pour it out and then you never get any more. It's that you're constantly getting more blessing as you're giving it. My dad has said for years concerning money, and, and this, this is certainly not a sermon on money, but it's a good example how, as a matter of fact, Jesus says, if you are not faithful with unrighteous mammon, unrighteous money, how will you get the true riches? And it is amazing. My dad always says, God can't bless a clenched fist. He can't bless a clenched fist. He can't, he can't put, you can't put money into a fist that's closed, but a hand that's open, he just pours it through. And I've seen that in many people's lives, and not just regarding money. God is not looking to groom those who have blessed lives of getting, but rather broken lives of giving. He blessed, he broke, he gave. That's another one of those recurring themes in Jesus' ministry. He always blessed it, then he broke it, and then he gave it. Getting is easy. It's easy to get. It's easy to be given gifts. Giving is a little more difficult. And it requires a brokenness without which we will never get to the third step of giving. Notice that three-step process. It's blessed, but then it's broke. And then it's given. Certainly, as I said, God does bless us and meet our needs. And He wants us, He says, He wants us to be like little children in the kingdom. He wants us to ask, but that is only the starting point. And I think of that moment where He says, unless you be like a little child. What, what, my, my kids are are of such age that they depend on me for everything. And they don't even really realize it. Samuel doesn't realize who butters his bread. He just knows most of the time it comes from mom. But he doesn't realize dad has to go to work and he comes up to me every day when he sees me and, work? Dad going to work? Yep, I'm going to work. But he has no real concept, and I, I'm trying to instill this in the oldest, that, you know, hey, dad goes to work to pay for your house and to pay for your clothes and to pay for the heat and to pay for your food and the, you know there, there's a lot that goes into this this just doesn't magically appear and at six years old that's a hard concept to grasp but that's how god wants us to be he wants us to be totally dependent on him but that's only the first step blessing is only the first step it's not the end all be all giving is the fulfillment of god's purpose in his people but his ultimate intention is to take us from blessedness to brokenness. A place of real maturity. I've heard the definition of maturity before, and I really like it. And it, it, and it was producing more than you consume. Right now, my little kids aren't very mature. And you know how I know that? They only consume. They're little consumers. Little crumb crunchers. They, they, they consume my food and they consume my time, and they, cons they consume in every, their, every area of their life, all they do is consume. And that's okay, because they're only 6, 4, and 2. But when they get to be 18, and they get to be 20, they better not just be only consuming. I remember when I, my, and, and just so, so you know, the, the definition I got, the person I got the definition from was my dad. He used to say that all, all the time when I was a teenager. Son, you need to start producing more than you consume. It's 1030 in the afternoon, you're still sleeping, let's go. You know, you got things you need to do around here. You know, I'm not, you, you, yeah, you're welcome to all the things in my house, but I expect a little bit of giving in return. You're of that age now. And that's how we are, should be as Christians. It, certainly we should be like little children in our approach to the Lord, realizing all, of we ha all that we have comes only from Him. But it does not stop there, and so many Christians fail to see that, that we need to start producing more than we're consuming. Taking us from blessedness to brokenness. And you know, the thing is, our flesh doesn't mind talking and hearing about being blessed and receiving. 
As I said, what, that, that prosperity teaching wouldn't be so popular if that wasn't the case. Our flesh is, oh boy, man, blessing? Bring it on. Let's hear more sermons about that. Let's hear some positive messages. We want to be blessed. I heard of a very well-known preacher. I'm sure you all know his name. His wife made a statement in the year, about a year ago, I think now, that God just wants to, wants to make sure, that, He just wants you to be happy. He just wants you to be happy. That is not God's intention only for our lives. Happiness may be a byproduct of that, but that is not what we should be teaching people in our churches, that God's, God's just out to make you happy. He's just out to have your life just be grand. Tell that to the, to the Christian in Africa who's being beheaded by ISIS for his faith. I'm sure he's really happy now where he's at, and things, he, he's glad that he laid down the sacrifice, but that whole concept of he just wants to, to bless you, that, that, that's a total uh, misstep as far as there's so much more to that. That's the first step. And as we, if we want to produce more than we consume, we've got to get past that first step. Our flesh doesn't even mind hearing about giving as long as it makes us feel good and it doesn't cost too much. Like I said, why do I enjoy Christmas so much? Because my kid, I like to give my kid gifts. But why do I, what, what, what is the enjoyment of giving my kids gifts? I like, I, I'm getting something out of it. I don't mind giving them gifts, and I don't mind giving them a lot of gifts. Again, as long as it doesn't cost me too much, there, there is a limit. I'm not going to go out and spend $5,000 on my two-year-old. It's just not going to happen. You know, I don't mind giving them, you know, buying $50 or $100 worth of gifts for them, but there's a limit. But that's how our flesh is. We don't mind hearing about all this stuff as long as it doesn't cost too much and as long as it makes us feel good. There, there's still something in it for us. But true giving is so much more. Thinking of Christ and His giving nature is our example. His giving was to the extreme. Think about this Christmas time. So uh, we, we all have thought of this before, but do we really truly meditate? I, sometimes I think it's good to meditate on certain things. We think of this little baby in a manger and how the nativity scene, that's so neat, and, and man, what, a, what an awesome thing that, that, that Christ did. But think, think on that for a moment. The eternal God... The eternal creator became a completely helpless baby who cries and messes his pants and can't, again, he is totally dependent on a human being. Think of that for a moment. The humility that that must have taken. Giving to the extreme. His place in heaven. His kingly honor and ultimately his life. That's giving to the extreme. Isaiah 66, verse 2, another one of my top end favorite verses. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit. We don't like to hear sermons about making ourselves poor. We like to hear sermons about getting rich or having God bless us, but sermons about being lowly and poor, you don't hear that. You don't read those in the bestsellers of the Christian bookstores. Initially, even the disciples turned away when the cost appeared to be too high. All of a sudden, Jesus is arrested. Things are going sideways and south. And even good old Peter, who was saying how he was going to stick it out to the very end, is denying the Christ. When all of a sudden, the cost got to be more than they want. Again, our flesh doesn't mind. We don't mind following this guy when there's thousands of people flocking to hear him speak. And he's doing all these mighty miracles. He's raising people from the dead and healing the lame and healing, opening blind eyes. But all of a sudden he's arrested and it looks like there's going to be some serious trouble. Then the cost is getting a little more than we were prepared to spend. Peter denies Jesus. And after the resurrection, resurrection Jesus enforces, reinforces his plan for Peter. And notice was it what, what it was. Peter, feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. What is that doing? What is that act? It's an act of giving. Peter, give. Take care of my followers. Take care of my sheep. And I think you probably all heard this, but it bears repeating. The, Greeks, the Greek words there were phileo and agape. Phileo is a brotherly love. Hey, you're my bud. You do things for me. I do things for you. We're good buds. There's, there's three types of words for love. There may have been more that I'm not aware of, but there was, er, there was eros, which was a sensual erotic. That's where we get our word erotic from. There was phileo, the brotherly love, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And then there was agape. How many of you know what agape is? 
completely pure love. Loving without any expectation of return. And, and more than even that, we all, we all think of that as such a high and mighty thing. But loving people who spitefully use you and who persecute you. Loving those who are your enemies. That's, that's a whole other stratosphere of love. And he says to Peter, Peter, do you agape me? Well, Lord, you know I phileo you. No, Peter, do you agape me? Well, Lord, you know I phileo you. And each time he says, tend my sheep. You want to learn agape love? Feed my sheep. Take care of my people. Become a giver. Take on my nature of giving to the extreme. And how many of you know at the end of Peter's life, he had taken, and, and, and Jesus actually ends that. He, he, Peter learned a life of brokenness. His, first of all, he denied Christ. Can you imagine living with that guilt? If that's going to break someone, that would, that would do it. Den- knowing that you denied the Christ, that would break you. And ultimately, he did feed the sheep and was instrumental in bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Many of you know Cornelius' men show up and, and, and Peter, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember this correctly, was the one who was kind of all against this whole whip preaching to the Gentiles. He thought it was for the Jews only. But remember, what was the transition in Jesus' ministry where he said, my hour has now come when the Gentiles sought him. And who was instrumental? Who was the one instrumental in doing that in, in, in the New Testament church? The guy who had denied him. The guy who had, had to be severely broken. Severely broken. And ultimately, Peter sacrificed his very life on the cross for the Master. He says, I'm not even worthy to be hung in the same manner. Hang me upside down. Peter learned not only to be blessed, but to be broken and then to give. And this is all good and well to talk about. As I've said so many times, we have all these buzzwords in Christianity. We all these, not only buzzwords, but buzz concepts. Yeah, we need to live lives of giving. That's, amen. Preach it, brother. We need to be givers. We need to be broken. And then we walk out and it's almost like, I, I don't even know if people do this, but, but myself, it's like, okay, so what? That's all well and good and I agree with all of that, but how does that actually apply to my life? Like, how do I implement that in my daily living? I think it's always good to figure out how the rubber really does meet the road. In an application tonight, Certainly, I don't think that this all means that we rush home and give away all that we have and just start, we need to sell our house and sell our cars and, 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 and just become missionaries with nothing to our names. Although, how many of you remember, there was someone that Jesus told that to, to ask that of and said, if you want to follow me, this is what you need to do. The rich young ruler. He may ask that of us. I have a young man who is a longtime acquaintance who just recently came to the Lord and he's a, built a, a business on his own from nothing and I was talking to him the night and he's, he's really on fire right now and he said you know the Lord I felt <clears throat> he allowed the business to cut in front of the Lord recently and in a, in a very small area I, I felt when he shared it with me but it was really big to him and especially being a, a new newer Christian in the faith and he he said I felt the Lord was calling me to put my business on the altar and he says I I don't think you understand how much this business means to me I built this from scratch and I've you know he shared with me some some details on how you know he said I've been extremely successful at this business he said, but I felt like the Lord's, you know, and as I'm listening to him, I'm just kind of, you know, grimacing a little bit. I'm like, oh, you know, sometimes new Christians, they, they, <laughs> they get kind of overzealous and extreme, which is good. But, you know, sometimes as a more mature Christian, you're like, Let, let's just slow this down and talk about this and make sure we're really hearing from the Lord, not just, you know, your imagination. And I'm like, oh boy, you know, I hope he's not, <laughs> not going to just go home and just say, I'm done with the business and, you know, just become a street, street dweller. And he says, but he goes, and, and I'm kind of starting to think, okay, how am I gonna, how am I gonna break this to him in a way that doesn't try to despiritualize what he's feeling, but doesn't, you know, I, I, there needs to be some discernment here. And, and I'm, I'm kind of scratching my head, thinking, okay, where are we going with this? And he says, and I felt like I was delaying my business on the altar. And he said, and I, I went home, and I, he said, I really struggled with it. He said, but I did, and I, you know, just said, Lord, I, I, if this business is yours, I lay it on the altar. And he said, I felt like the Lord said, okay, son, that, that's what I wanted. Not that he was really going to take the business from him and just say, figure, you know, I've got something, you know, I want you to be a missionary or be homeless or whatever. But he, he said he felt like the Lord was just wanting to, wanting to make it clear to him, this, I come before this business. And if I ask you to give up the business, then that's my choice. So certainly I think the Lord can and does ask that of certain people. I'm not saying that this is the application for all of us. But the first thing I want to look at, and more so than even the giving tonight, 
an application of all this is brokenness. What does brokenness actually mean to us as Christians? I believe one of the things it means is when He allows trials and tribulations in our lives, we embrace them. We embrace them, as in we lay hold of them, not try to squirm and wiggle our way out of them and and beat God's door down until He removes the situation from our lives. We embrace them, and as we sang this this evening, we rejoice in the midst of them. It's real easy to say, yeah, we need to rejoice in all things when we're being blessed, but when the brokenness part comes, that becomes a little harder. I've touched on this before in the past. We need to make sure that we're not always seeking to get out of the fire. What does the fire speak of in the Scripture? What does it do to us? It purifies us. It refines us. So if we're constantly uprooting ourselves from the fire and figuring out how we can get away from this heat, I... I like heat right now, especially when it's zero degrees outside. It's, it's a nice thing to have. My, we got a wood stove installed in our house this year. Or not a wood stove, sorry, a, a gas stove. And we framed it in, and we're getting ready to put the chimney parts up and the, the stone and all that. And boy, I'll tell you what, the other day it was cold, man. I cranked that thing up, and I was like, ooh, that feels good. But I certainly wouldn't want to open up the, the vent and stick my hand right in the flame. That's not good. <laughs> we're trying to teach Sam that there are things that are very hot and we don't touch. They're nice to look at and feel the heat from. But we don't like... Heat is fine as long as there's a distance there. And spiritually, it's the same thing. We don't mind a little bit of heat. Oh, you know, just I'm kind of going through it, Lord. I, I, the Lord will get me through. I'm just I'm rejoicing in all things. But when He really starts cranking up the furnace and sticks us right in the middle of it because He wants to purify us, then it's like, what is our prayer? It's amazing. And I look at this in my own life. My prayers are constantly, Lord, can, you know, I'm really going through it right now. Can you please deliver me from this situation? Lord, I need to be delivered. Even the psalmist was doing that. Lord, I want to, please, please deliver me from my enemies and all this stuff. And I, and I think that sometimes we get so fixated on the destination we don't realize the Lord is more concerned with the journey. That He wants us to go through the fire because He has a goal for that fire. He wants us to be purified because without that heat, gold doesn't get purified. It remains, it remains unpurified. Not always seeking to get out of the fire, but yielding to God's handiwork. Yielding. I love that word yielding as in lord if this is what you want if this is the trial you want for me i accept it you all know my mom recently passed away and when i was home for the funeral it was a very emotional time and my one brother made the statement he said you know there's a crime scene here there's a crime scene the only problem is the lord's fingerprints are all over it There's a crime scene here, but the Lord's fingerprints are all over it. It was amazing. I've told you many times, I mean, my mom had a, and I believe it was of the Lord without a doubt, had a two-hour conversation right before she passed away, totally unbeknownst to either of us that she was, her time was short. And I will never forget, we talked about a lot of different things, the thing that, again, as I said earlier, people's last words, right? Those are kind of important. And I know for a fact that that was of the Lord, that conversation. It has given me tremendous comfort during this time. And the thing she said, the two, she said, Justin, and she said this through tears. She was really going through some fires. She said, the two things I've come to the realization in my spiritual life that is the most important is brokenness and humility. Those was my mom's last words for me. Brokenness and humility. How many of you remember the story of Jacob? Jacob was quite the character. He was a shyster, to put it mildly. Jacob means conniver. He was always trying to figure a way how to be blessed. He stole the blessing from his brother. He stole the birthright. He's always trying to figure out how he can get something. He's not, he wasn't much of a giver. He was a total getter. But it's interesting in the story of Jacob's life how Do you know the point, the transition point when he began to fulfill his calling? He wrestled with God, and what was the end result of that? His thigh was put out of socket, and he he limped from the rest of for the rest of his life, Jacob was a broken person. Isn't that interesting? People think, ah, the Old Testament, that's just a bunch of stories. It's not really, you know, we need to we need to read the epistles. Well, the whole all scripture is profitable, right? Isn't that interesting? That story of Jacob, the moment he began to fulfill his calling was when he finally allowed himself 
to be broken. He's wrestling, he's wrestling, he's wrestling. He's even, even the story surrounding it, if you read it, he, he's, he's afraid. He, he's basically, <laughs> Jacob has made his own bed and now he's getting ready to lie in it. He, he has sown his oats and now the, the chickens are coming home to roost. Esau is going to have his, have his day. And Jacob is dreadfully afraid of this man, and rightfully so. And he says, well, let's, let's separate. I mean, think of this guy. You send my wife and kids first. <laughs> well, I can't even imagine that. Send my wife, let's, let's split up in two camps. That way, if, if he attacks one, the other one, you know, mainly the one I'm in, will be able to escape, right? I mean, what a, what a guy. You talk about, a, 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 there's a reason he was called the supplanter and the conniver. But all of a sudden, Jacob's going through these trials. He's in the middle of a big one. It may mean his life. And he meets a stranger in the middle of the night. I can only imagine he's walking in the darkness pretty scary place knows he's about ready to face some serious issues with his brother who wants to kill him and a hand grabs him in the middle of the dark i can imagine he, he his his blood pressure was pretty high when that happened and these two got these these two people begin to wrestle and it was amazing because even when his thigh finally gets touched what does he say who are you we know he knew who he was if you read later in that that in the scripture Jacob knew who it was. I think even in that moment, Jacob still had that, Lord, who are you? There was something in it for him. He, and, and, and the Lord doesn't even answer him, really. The Lord, the Lord <laughs> when he asked Jacob, what's your name? He wasn't doing it because he really didn't know. He wanted Jacob to finally admit who he was. He wanted Jacob to be broken. Because you can only begin fulfilling your calling until you, you won't be able to begin fulfilling your calling until you're broken. And maturity only comes through blessing, then brokenness, and then giving. It's amazing, too, when you think about that. Now that his thigh is touched, he can't run. He can't escape. There's no getting out of this fiery trial. But that's the thing. That's the key to brokenness. God's will is often not to deliver us from our trials. Let that sink in for a second. A lot of times God's desire and His intention is not to deliver you from your trial, but to break you so that you are totally and completely dependent on Him. Jacob, now, th th there was his back's against the wall. He is certainly in a rock and a hard place. He already knows he's in, a, he's in a rock and a hard place, but now he can't even run. There's no getting away. There's only one thing he can do at this point, and that is to completely and totally rely on the Redeemer. When we become truly broken, when we finally get to the place where we realize there's nothing else I can do. My mom, I mentioned, she went through all these trials and she told me, Justin, she said, I, I feel that the Lord has spoken to me to stand still and see his salvation. Stand still, stand still, stand still. And she told me that over and over and over and over again. I do believe, without a doubt, my mom finally got to the place of complete and total brokenness. And that's when the Lord says, now that you have learned what I have for you, I'm taking you home. I'm going to remove you out of your fiery trial. For her, it meant promotion to the next life. But it took her learning those lessons before he took, takes her home. And it's amazing. If you look at the lives of a lot of people, a lot of Christians, it's like the Lord deals, they don't go home until they finally get certain things dealt with. It's amazing to me to see that, that principle wor worked out in the lives of Christian people. How many of you heard of the man A.W. Tozer? Really godly man, right? He made this statement, and I, I really love this statement. I, I <laughs> don't necessarily like the idea of it being applied. The, again, the, the, the idea of being broken is, is great until it starts actually hitting us, and then it's not so much fun. But this is a very true statement. He said, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly. We, oh boy, preach it, Tozer. That's what we want to hear in the modern day 2015 church body of Christ in America. God, blessing? My ear, I'm all ears. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has heard him deeply. I think Tozer was on to something with that statement. And if you look through the men of God, I don't care whether it was David or whether it was Moses or the Apostle Paul or even Jesus Christ, what was Jesus' final exaltation? Complete brokenness, the surrender of his life. Brokenness, here's the whole key of the whole matter when it comes to brokenness, is the end 
of self-dependence. When the Lord breaks us to the point of complete and total brokenness, what does He say? Fall on the rock and be broken. Because it's a whole lot better for that to happen than the rock to fall on you and crush you and grind you to find powder. But brokenness is the end of self-dependence. That's the whole reason we want to be broken. And then the next step, giving. It means that we are on the lookout. How does this apply? We are on the lookout for opportunities to meet the needs of others. My mom's funeral, I, I know you guys didn't see. We all gave as children. We gave testimony, I guess you could say, or a, just, just a, a tribute is the word I'm looking for to my mom's life. Of course, I'm biased because she's my mom, but I, those of you who knew her well know this is very true. I made the statement, the sum total of my mom's life was finding needs and meeting them. That's who she was. She found needs and she met them. It didn't matter if it was her kids. It didn't matter if it was her kids' friends. It didn't matter if it was someone in her church. She simply found a need and met it. Notice I used the word found. Our attitude of giving should not always be waiting for the opportunity to present itself. Certainly, opportunities will present ourselves. But a giver, like Jesus, goes out and seeks and finds needs that he can meet. That is the nature of the Father. That is the nature of Jesus. And that is the nature he wants in us as givers. Putting others first rather than ourselves. And again, that's easy to do once you've completed the second step of brokenness. And then lastly, giving to God is the ultimate. Making Him our priority, like my friend I mentioned who realized I can't put my business in front of God. Giving to God our time, giving to God our resources, giving to God, building the, seeking first the kingdom, building the kingdom. And how many of you know, when it comes to giving, it should be sacrificial. It's easy to give out of abundance. It's a little easier to get, a little harder to give when it starts to cost us. But again, if you're a broken person, that's, that's not hard to do. I mean, have heard the statement, a dead horse doesn't care if he's whipped. Right? A broken person doesn't care about giving sacrificially. And I love, and we, 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 we looked at this in a sermon recently, David, I will not offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. Jacob, David could have very easily, Arana was saying, King, here, here use my threshing floor. And, and matter of fact, I'll give you the, the, the oxen and I'll give you even the wood. He says, no, 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 you don't understand. David's a kingdom man. He understands kingdom principles. He says, no, that's not how I work. That's not, that's not acceptable to God. God doesn't want, you know, Cain. Oh, Lord, I'll give you the abundance of my, my possessions and my fruit. No, Cain, that's not what I want. I want, your, I want a sheep. You're not giving the way I prescribed, the prescribed manner. Giving should be sacrificial in our lives. And in conclusion, I read from Matthew 11, 29, 30. Keeping in mind the nature of our Father, and his son, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. His is the yoke of brokenness. And the reason it's easy, the reason he says this is easy, you think, man, Lord, I <laughs> put my feet to the fire, not just my feet, but my whole body. That, whew. I, I, you know, this isn't, I mean, I know this is what I need to mature, but it's, is there some other way? Like even Jesus, you know, Father, if there be any other way. No, son, there's not. You can't skip steps. And you think, man, that's difficult. But the reason he says it's easy, how can he say it's easy and it's light? Because he, how many of you know a double yoke has two sides to it, right? There isn't just one ox pulling on a double yoke. There's two. Well, the reason it's easy and the reason it's light is because we have, the Son carrying it with us, showing us the way by example. He has shown the way and has sent His Holy Spirit. What does He say? I've sent you the Comforter to show you the way. To give us the strength to bear up under the pressure of brokenness and giving. How many of you know the way up in God's kingdom is always what? Down. Down. Brokenness and giving I believe this with all my heart, our transition points to spiritual maturity. We have a lot of 
baby Christians running around just, Lord, it's kind of like, like little birds. I always laugh with them, the kids when they're real hungry, man. They're like, I said, man, those kids, are, they're, they're mama, mommy, mommy, mommy. I want, you know, I want some food. I want some food. I want some food. I'm like, they're like a bunch of those little birds in the nest just jibber-jabbering at their mom to put a worm in their mouth. And it's kind of funny to me. You know, sometimes it's very irritating as well. But, but it's like Christians are so often like that. Father, give me, 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 give me. And he's saying, that's my nature, and I will. Even in spite of your wrong desires, I'll still give it to you. But that shouldn't be what you're desiring. You should be saying, Father, give me that and bless me that I can be broken and give to others and give back to you. Because the way up in God's kingdom is always down. Brokenness and giving are transition points of maturity. And in following these steps, we may not get the best life now that you like hear about in all the Christian bookstores and on the radio and on the TV. But like Christ, our lives of brokenness and giving will bring honor and glory to the Father. We will become other-centered instead of self-centered. And we will become highly influential in shining His light in a dark and a desperate world. Human nature is to get. Human nature is to receive. And when you become someone that's truly broken and truly a giver, men will notice. Women will notice. People who are not saved will think, this is not normal. What is different about this person? And our lives will truly be a praise to His glory and a tangible. Remember what I've said in the past. Words don't have a whole lot of weight. Actions do. Actions truly speak louder than words. And if we want to have a tangible witness, this is the way to do it. A tangible witness of His wonderful, giving, and loving nature. Amen? Let's stand this evening. Father, we ask tonight that you would truly teach us brokenness. Lord, it's easy to be blessed and to get and receive. Lord, there's even times it's easy to give, but Lord, the brokenness part, that's the step we all like to skip. But Lord, we know there's no skipping steps in your kingdom. Your kingdom is principled, it's built on foundations that are not movable. And Lord, as we truly think about brokenness and we look at our lives and the times that you have sent difficult, difficult trials in every life here, Lord, we, we don't really like that part. And Father, we are hesitant to ask you to bring them again into our lives to teach us the brokenness we really need. Lord, we're reluctant to be broken because we're humans and that's our nature. But Lord, we don't want human nature. We don't want fleshly nature to reign in us. We want the nature of Christ who sacrificed everything for us. Lord, truly we ask tonight that you would take our lives and make them your own. Lord, teach us to be broken. Lord, bless our lives, we pray, that we may become broken and poured out to others. Broken and spilled out for you, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would teach us to apply this to our lives on a daily basis, that, Lord, the rubber would meet the road in these areas of our lives. And, Lord, we know that you will give us the grace and strength to bear up and endure under the pressures. Lord, refine us as pure gold, we pray. We ask all this in your precious and holy name. In the name of Jesus.